فبسمله والحمد لله وأصلي وأسلم على المبعوث رحمة للعالمين نبينا وحبيبنا محمد وعلى آله وصحبه أجمعين. So we're continuing our commentary to uh, this beautiful and powerful surah that was revealed in the very early period of Islam, Surah Al-Qalb. And as a reminder, in the last session we had discussed verses 10 to 12. Where our Lord Subhanahu wa Taala says, "Audo billah al-Sami al-Alim min al-Shaytan al-Rajim, wa la tuti kulla halaf mahin, hamazim mashaim binamin, manna al al-Khairi mu'tadin atim." So do not obey any contemptual, contemptible, habitual swearer, one who frequently takes oaths uh, by the name of Allah or by another besides Allah Subhanahu wa Taala. A slanderer, a gossip monger, a withholder of good, transgressor, an evildoer. So in these verses we said in the last session that our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala is listing the qualities that he condemns in the specific set of disbelievers who are opposing the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam such as Al-Walid ibn Mughira and others and as well these qualities because they come generally, they mention generally we find they are general condemnation of anyone who has these qualities the quality of being contemptible the quality of swearing by Allah frequently or swearing, making oaths frequently the quality of slandering and backbiting and abusing and spreading gossip the quality of withholding good the quality of not giving charity the quality of transgression and oppression the quality of living a life of sin all of these are qualities that our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala has condemned and he has told us that anyone who has these qualities is disqualified from uh, being obeyed he is not deserving of being held in high regard. Such a person is not deserving of being taken as a role model. And these qualities we said were listed in contrast to the khuluq adheem, the impeccable, outstanding character of our Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam. Allah is telling us that these qualities that he is condemning in people, his Messenger sallallahu alayhi wa sallam is far removed from these qualities. He does not have these qualities. And likewise, the righteous believers who try to follow him as closely as possible, sallallahu alayhi wa sallam, likewise, they do not have these qualities. They are not bearers of such characteristics and lowly traits. That's a very brief summary of what we discussed last session. Today, we'll continue with this list of qualities that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has condemned in the disbelievers that were opposing the Messenger والسلام, and that he has condemned in general as well. So in ayah number 13, our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala, he says, أُطُلِّمْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ زَنِيمٌ أُطُلِّمْ بَعْدَ ذَلِكَ زَنِيمٌ Cruel. And on top of all of that, ignoble. So, the word أُطُل in the Arabic language, it effectively means someone who has got evil khuluq. Someone who's got bad morals and manners. Someone who uh, behaves in a cruel and a coarse manner. It comes from the word atala, which means to drag in a rough and cruel manner. That's the original meaning of this word. So the meaning of the word atul is to be someone who has this, this base, this mean, this despicable character that leads to him being cruel, to being rough, to being coarse. So. We translated it as cruel, but it means a bit more than that. This characteristic is this mannerism of being rough and coarse as well. This mannerism of being, uh, having not, not having these refined morals and manners, not having this khuluq adheem that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam was described with. And then we have a second quality mentioned in this ayah, zaneem. And zaneem is an interesting word. And it has, if you look at the books of tafsir, there are a number of different meanings that they give, all of them are related if you like. The most common meaning is someone who is an outcast, someone who doesn't really belong to a people, like an illegitimate child. 
And so that's one, the common meaning. Another meaning is that it's related to the word zanama. Zanim comes from zanama. And zanama is uh, an act that, they, that the Arab used to do. They cut a small portion of the ear of a camel. This act, zanama describes this act where they cut a small portion of the ear of a camel or another animal. And they leave this cut, this ear, this portion hanging. And they would do this for animals that were regarded to be precious or held in high esteem. And so the zanim, when you link to this, is someone who thinks himself, or someone who thinks a great deal about himself. Someone who holds himself in high esteem. Someone who's got this air of superiority around him. So the zanim actually means here in this context, linked to this idea of marking a camel or an animal in a way to mark it out as being something special, is that zanim, when it comes to a human being, is someone who regards himself to be something special. Um, also, it's said that the word zanama, it refers to the fleshy skin that hangs below the ears or the throats of animals. And it refers to something redundant or something extraneous. And linked to this is that common meaning that it refers to, when it's applied to a human being, it refers to an illegitimate or an adopted child. Someone who does not belong to the family in reality. Someone who doesn't belong to a tribe in reality. So this common meaning comes from this idea of zanama, which is this extra piece of flesh that hangs off the ear or the throat of an animal. Something that's extraneous and redundant. And likewise, from there they get this idea that Zanim is an illegitimate child or an adopted child. He doesn't really belong to the family. He doesn't really belong to a tribe. He doesn't really belong to a particular nation. He's been brought in externally. So the word Zanim is either someone who thinks a great deal about himself, someone who's arrogant, or the word zanim is someone who is an uh, outcast, or an outsider, or an illegitimate child. Uh, again, when we look at the reason why this ayah was revealed, or told him about the dhalik zanim, some of the scholars have mentioned that it was again revealed with regards to Al-Walid ibn al mughira who we know was one of the greatest opponents of the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. And it is said that Al-Walid ibn al mughira was actually a child of illegal intercourse. He was actually a child of illegal intercourse. And, in, and he was someone who had been adopted by the Quraysh. And until this revelation, this ayah, no one actually knew that this was his background that he was a child of illegal intercourse and that he was adopted or rather that he was a child of illegal intercourse and so uh, the specific reference according to these scholars the Walid ibn Bukhir, and it basically exposed him as being a child of illegal intercourse but as we said previously even we said the previous verses also about the Walid ibn Bukhir and others as well we said that even though it may have specifically been revealed with regards to him the ayah Allah left it general. He didn't specify that this person I'm speaking about is Al-Walid ibn Mughira. And therefore we take it in its general meaning. And we use Al-Walid ibn al mughira as a case, of a case and example of what this ayah is talking about. He is an example of what this ayah is talking about. The ayah is not restricted to him or confined to him. Why? Because Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala chose to make the wording of this ayah general. And therefore we take it as general. And when we say that we take it as general, what we're saying is that Allah is condemning anyone who has these two qualities. The first quality, someone who is cruel. Someone who is cruel. Someone who has a coarse character. Someone who is uh, indecent. Someone who is hateful. And an example that some of the scholars said, someone who is entrenched in disbelief. Someone who would ardently defend falsehood. Knowing it to be false, but still defending it's an example of this coarse character, this mean character. You know it's a lie, you know it's false, you know it's not true, yet you defend it anyway, or you promote it anyway as well. All of these ideas are, are linked to this word that Allah, or this characteristic that Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala is condemning in this ayah. Cruel, coarse, indecent, hateful, entrenched in disbelief, someone who ardently defends, defends falsehood. And this is why Ali, when he explained this word, Atul, he said it's someone with mean 
base morals and manners. And Ibn Abbas he said is someone with a severe and coarse personality. Someone with a severe and coarse personality. And a person who has this quality is actually talked about by the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam. In his words when he said, Should not tell you about the people of Paradise. That it is every meek, humble person. If they swore an oath by Allah, Allah would fulfill that oath. It's every meek, humble person. He's looked down upon, he's weak, uh, he doesn't have standing in society, but he's got such a relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. That if he took an oath by Allah, Allah would fulfill that oath. Then the Messenger of Allah said, should I not tell you about the people of Hellfire? Kullu utulli, the same word that Allah mentions in this ayah. Jawadin mustakbirin. It is every cruel, rude, arrogant person. It's every cruel, rude, arrogant person. So this is the first quality mentioned in this particular ayah that Allah has condemned. The second one is, as we said, the word uh, signified by the word zanin. And when you look at the words of the Salaf, like Ibn Abbas, he said it's someone who's known to be evil. Someone who's easily recognizable as someone who is someone who is an evil person, a despicable person. And this is coming from that idea of that, you know, the ear being cut with this protruding piece of flesh, an extraneous piece of flesh that singles out that animal, that points out that animal. So Ibn Abbas is saying that the Zanim is called so because he is a person, as you, when you see him, you say, this is a person, this is an evil person, avoid this person. He's a despicable, cruel, horrible person. You don't want to be near such people. He's so open and so blatant about his sins and his transgression and his evil that he's known for it. It's his defining quality. Ali when he explains the word Zanim, he says, every ignoble, lowly disbeliever. And again, Ibn Abbas, someone who is excessively oppressive. Someone who is excessively oppressive. All of these are ideas linked to this characteristic that our Lord subhanahu wa ta'ala has condemned here. And one of the explanations of the word Zanim is a child born out of wedlock, an illegitimate child. Right. This specifically it refers to Al Walid ibn Mughira. And as Ibn Kathir, rahmatullah he says, that again, this is an example of a zanim. Right? It's not constrained to this meaning. The word zanim is a constraint to an illegitimate child, but it's an example. And why is it an example? Because if you, in that society, and actually in many societies, even to this day, in that society, an illegitimate child, due to the circumstances in his life, and due to the way that he or she would be treated, would often end up as being corrupt, would often end up growing up dishonest and falling prey to the wilds of shaitan. So the zanim as an illegitimate child, the idea is still linked to the original meaning of being someone who is, you know, uh, someone who is uh, lowly and ignoble, someone who uh, is uh, despicable, someone who is uh, known to be evil, someone who arouses suspicion by his very presence. So, an illegitimate child is one of the meanings that's linked to this meaning, uh, this general concept, simply because in those societies, such a child would be treated in a way that would probably make him more open, more susceptible to the trips, the traps and whispers of Shaitan. So, Atul, someone who's cruel, someone who's a coarse characteristic, coarse mannerisms, and someone who's Zanin. Someone who is <coughs> known for his evil. Someone whose very presence arouses suspicion. Someone who is despicable. These are qualities condemned here. Utullim ba'da dhalika zanim. Allah in between saying utul and zanim, you could just said both together with a, with a common mark, common mark in between. But Allah uses the word ba'da dhalik. And ba'da dhalik means after all that. Or alongside this. After all that, ba'da dhalik. So after all the qualities mentioned in previous to, these, to, these, um, to this particular ayah, Allah says, 
So Baba Dalek is being used in a symbolic sense to indicate an increase in severity. I, after all we've described him with, he has another quality on top of this that's even worse. That's even worse. And that is that he is Zanin. He is ignoble. He is evil. His very character is evil. So the very fact that Allah said Ba'da Dalik before saying Zanin shows us that out of this list of qualities that we mentioned so far that Allah has condemned, this is the worst one mentioned so far. This is the worst one. And why is it the worst one? Because someone who is Zanin, uh, his heart becomes hard. Someone who is Zanin is someone hard of heart. And someone who is hard of heart is someone who is distant from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. Someone who has lost the love of Allah in his heart and also Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala has turned away from him as well. Waha. And such a person whose heart of heart finds it easy to commit sin. Such a person has lost the quality of haya, has lost the quality of mod modesty and shyness. And therefore he even perhaps even openly broadcasts his sin and actually uh, uh, publicizes sin and be proud of the sins that he's committing. He is someone effectively who is drowning in sin and living a life of sin and proud of that. <coughs> Zanin, because of the hardness of his heart. <coughs> Ibn Taymiyyah he says, if you look at these ayat we've been discussing so far, with all these qualities that Allah is condemning, he says we can divide them into two general sets of qualities. And they mentioned like the first, first grouping is at the beginning, then we get a second grouping. The first grouping is the fact that this person is contemptible, that he's a habitually swears oaths by other than Allah, that he is a slanderer and a backbiter and a gossip monger. He says, if you think about these qualities, they focus on the words a person speaks, what comes out of his mouth. And that's the focus on them. There may be like uh, the actions, you can do the same thing but deeds, that's a secondary concern. These qualities primarily talk about the words a person says, slandering, backbiting, spreading gossip, taking oaths by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala, having this being maheem, something contemptible, but because of the way you speak, right? These are all focusing on the words that a person says. And the second grouping is someone he withholds good, someone who doesn't give charity, someone who transgresses, someone who oppresses, someone who is a living a life steeped in evil, someone who is cruel, someone who is ignoble. He says if you think about these qualities, they focus on the deeds that a person does and his interactions with other people, with words being a secondary concern. So when you consider the first group of categories, the first category that's being talked about here, often if you look at what they do, they violate the honour and the sanctity of a person. And the second group of qualities, if you look at what they primarily focus on, they violate, violate the rights of another individual, not giving him his due, uh, transgressing against him, etc. So, the, so Ibn Taymiyyah says, if you think about this, Allah is telling us that the believer doesn't do either of these. He does not transgress against the person in speech, in words, and neither does he transgress a person in deed. Neither does he violate the honour of another individual, a Muslim, and the sanctity of another Muslim, and neither does he transgress his rights, and neither does he withhold his due. The believer doesn't do any of these two general categories. He also states, Ibn Taymiyyah that if you look again these sets of verses, there's two categories of people, if you look at it in a particular way. فَلَا تُطِئِ الْمُكَذِّبِينَ Do not uh, obey the denier, the disbeliever. وَلَا تُطِئِ كُلَّ حَلَّافِمْ And then also do not obey the rest of these people who, who have these qualities. So Allah is telling the believer not to obey the disbeliever and not to look up to the disbeliever and not to take him as a role model, the denier. And also not to uh, obey or to take as a role model or to aspire to be like anybody, be it a Muslim or a non-Muslim, who has these qualities listed in this ayah. Both are being prohibited, prescribed in this set of verses. Why? Because they go against, they, 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 they're, they're the exact opposite of the qualities that the believer is enjoined to have. Iman and righteous deeds. Iman. So Allah is saying, don't be like the deniers. Don't be like the disbelievers. 
وعمل الصالحات لا سيف ولا تتقل ولا تتقل كل حلاف المهين or rest of the qualities there. So again, Ibn Taymiyyah is actually saying if you look about, think about these sets of verses, they're actually the exact opposite of what we should be like. They're going against, against the, they're the exact opposite of what the two core qualities are that are repeated over and over again for the believer in the Quran. Iman and righteous deeds. These people don't have them. They're going against them. And it's because of Iman and righteous deeds that the believer as Khuluq Adin has got uh, impeccable character. And the believers can be taken as role models. The righteous believers can be taken as people to aspire towards. And it's because of the absence of these that the disbeliever and those who have these qualities, uh, Mahin, etc., don't deserve to be aspired towards, don't deserve to be obeyed, and don't deserve to be followed. One of the benefits we've learned in addition to what we discussed so far from this ayah is that we learn from this ayah because Allah is condemning these two, these two qualities. We learn that Allah wants to see in us the opposite of these qualities. And that is a quality of gentleness. And that's a quality of not being harsh and cruel. <coughs> Allah's Messenger sallallahu ta'ala alayhi wa sallam, he said, Inna rifqa la yakunu fi shay illa zana. That gentleness does not enter anything except that it beautifies it, except that it adorns it. وَلَا يُنْزَعُ مِنْ شَيْءٍ إِلَّا شَامَةٍ And it's not stripped away from anything except that it disfigures it. It's not taken away from anything except that it disfigures it. مَا كَانَ الْفُحْشُ فِي شَيْءٍ قَطْءٍ إِلَّا شَامَةٍ The Messenger of Allah said that uncouth behavior, vulgar behavior, does not enter anything except that it disfigures it. It makes it ugly. Moreover, if you think about these qualities being talked about here, where Allah is condemning a quality of a person who is easily identifiable as someone who is evil, whose very presence arouses suspicion and doubt. By Allah condemning these qualities, Allah is telling us we need to be the opposite. We need to be someone who is easily identifiable as a person of good. Someone who you know, oozes integrity. Someone whose very presence makes people comfortable around them. They won't, they won't be suspicious, there will be no doubt. You know, what, what he says or what she says will be taken at, at face value because the Muslim is known for that quality. We don't want to be like the disbeliever being condemned in this ayah. The Muslim, by nature, is a person who spreads goodness throughout society, throughout the communities he lives in. Wherever the Muslim is in the world, be it in a Muslim community, be it in a non-Muslim community, the Muslim should be identifiable as a person of good, as a person who spreads goodness. The, person, the Muslim, by nature, is kareem. He's a person of karam, someone who's forbearing, someone who's generous, someone who's kind and gentle and patient, someone who's self-possessed, someone who's noble, not ignoble. The Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa sallam said that Allah is generous, Allah has his quality of karam and loves generosity. He loves noble conduct and he detests bad immoral conduct. He loves noble conduct and he detests bad, immoral conduct. And likewise, again, going back to uh, our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam specifically, because remember, these, the, in the first instance, this, this set of qualities is being used to contrast the character of the Messenger to the character of his opponents. So when we look to the Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, we see that he was someone, even before Revelation, he was someone known for his nobility. Someone known for his generosity. Someone known to, for his kindness to friend and foe. Someone known to be truthful. Someone known who's, someone whose very presence uh, led to someone feeling comfortable, feeling safe. When he first receives a revelation, he rushes home, shaken by the experience. He rushes home to his wife, Khadija radiallahu anh. How did she console him? She said, by Allah, Allah would never humiliate you. You are good to your relatives. You are true to your word. You help those in need, you support the weak, you are generous to the guest, and you answer the call of those who are in distress. This was his character even before Revelation. This was a character of the Prophet, وسلم, 
And this should be the character of those who walk his footsteps, the Ummah Muhammad alayhi salatu wasalam. And this current, this generosity we're talking about, is actually a reflection of the taqwa, the mindfulness, the awareness that the Muslim has in his heart. The greater the taqwa, the greater the nobility of that Muslim. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, Inna akramakum indallahi atqaqum, inna Allah alimun khabir. That the ones amongst you have the most karam, the ones amongst you who are the most precious and the most noble in the sight of Allah are those who are most mindful of you. Those are the most taqwa of you. Inna Allah alimun khabir, Allah is truly all knowing and all aware. Allah is truly all knowing and all aware. So this is yet another benefit we learn from this ayah. That we need to be people who are known to be good. Easily, not just, known, uh, not just people who are good, but people who are easily identifiable as good. Someone, people who are known as people of goodness or spread goodness. Unlike this person who is known for evil and known to arouse suspicion. Another benefit from this ayah is that unlike al walid ibn al mughira who was a specific example of who this ayah refers to, who is a product of illegitimate uh, intercourse, our Messenger Sallallahu Alaihi Wasallam, his lineage, his ancestry was known and it was known for his purity. It was known for his purity. There's no illegitimate aspect to his lineage at all. He alayhi salatu wasalam, said, I was passed through the best generations of the children of Adam. When you look at each of my ancestors, each level of my ancestors, I was passed through the best of the generations of each of the levels, generation after generation, until I reached the generation in which I came. And likewise, he sallallahu alayhi wa said, Allah chose Kinana from amongst the descendants of Ismail. And he chose the Quraysh from amongst the descendants of Kinana. And from the Quraysh, he chose Banu Hashim. And from the Banu Hashim, he chose me. <coughs> so from the Quraysh, he chose Banu Hashim. And from the Banu Hashim, he chose me. So, Utullim ba'da dhalika zaneem. Someone who is <coughs> cruel. And on top of all that, someone who's ignoble, someone who's evil, someone who's known for his coarse behavior, and someone whose very presence arouses suspicion. Then Allah goes on to say, An kana dha mali wa baneen. An kana dha mali wa baneen. Simply because he has wealth and sons. Simply because he has wealth and sons. So, <coughs> the first thing to uh, consider here is that scholars mention that this ayah, either it connects directly to the verses that have just preceded, i.e. it's a logical progression of those verses. So, Allah is saying, that he has these qualities simply because he has been blessed with wealth and sons. And he's, you know, uh, got status as a result, he's got power as a result. So his power and his status and his wealth, his love for the dunya has made him like this. This is one understanding of this ayah. Another understanding is it's actually linked to the ayah that comes next in the, in the surah. And Kanada Mali Mabani, Ida Tutla Alehi, Ayatuna Kala Asati Rul Awalin. Now, when our verses are recited to him, he says these are just fables of the, of the ancient. They're just made up stories of the past. So, the ayah then means that because he has wealth and children and status and power, again, his arrogance is making him think, making him not look to the Quran as it deserves to be looked at, not contemplate the Quran as it deserves to be looked at. And he just blurts out without thinking. These are just tales of the past, they're just made up stories. This is another explanation. All of these are not incompatible, they're all actually meant in this ayah. The third explanation in the majority view is that it's actually linked to the very beginning of this passage that talks about these qualities that Allah has condemned. I don't obey everyone who is given uh, to making oaths. Don't obey everyone who is contemptible. Simply because he has wealth and sons. 
Don't allow his wealth, don't allow his sons, don't allow his standing and his power to deceive you. Right? Don't obey him simply because he's got the status in society. That status in itself doesn't make him deserving of obedience. That status and wealth doesn't make him deserving of being looked up to. Those things in themselves don't mean much. In themselves don't mean much. So these are three explanations of how this ayah connects to either the verse before, verses before or the verses after. Who can repeat them back to me? All of them are meant because, as we know in the principle of the series, if you have an explanation that is not incompatible, then all of them are meant. So we say all three are meant here. All three are meant. I can tell people who are really paying attention. Go on. Go on. Well, one of them is Awali uh, ibn Mughira, he was said to have a lot of wealth and children as well. So that's one of the explanations. Yeah, but that's not what I mentioned. I never mentioned that one. But yes, true, it's true. He's an example of that. Sorry, and that's, that's the reason why, uh, just because he has the lot, a lot of children, he has his qualities. He shouldn't be deceived by it. Yeah, exactly. Okay, he, just because he has this wealth and status, etc., don't think, don't be deceived by that. Don't be deceived by the fact that someone who's got this wealth and status uh, is somehow deserving of being followed. What else can I say? What else can I say? That's one. Go that is the third point. Third one, yeah. The first two, were, it's either linked to the ayah before or the ayah after. Yeah. So the ayah before is Ortul Lim Barak so that he has those qualities of being cruel and you know and so on because he is. Yeah. And the second one is because he has that, then therefore in the next ayah, he rejects, he rejects the most yeah. of, yeah. yeah. of the ancients. Okay. So that's how this ayah connects to the verses before and the verse after. Uh, we also have kira'at of this ayah, different kira'at. We know that the Messenger of Allah sallallahu alayhi wa uh, received the Qur'an in different modes and he recited it in different modes. And these modes are all from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And they complement each other and they support each other. They're all from revelation. So one of the recitations of this ayah is A'an kana dha mali There's an extra hamza at the beginning, which is a question mark, a hamza of a question mark, interrogation. So the translation is, is it because he has wealth and sons? Right. So, is simply because he has wealth and sons. That's the translation. And, is it because he has wealth and sons? Right. Again, so in this recitation, the linkages are the same. But now Allah is asking the question to make us think and to make us think about this. Is it because he has children and son? Is it because of this that he's having these qualities that's made him like this? Is it because he's got children and sons that, that makes him easily reject or the, the revelation? Is it because he uh, has children and sons that you would be more likely to obey him and follow him? Right. So the addition of the question here is really to make us, since the meaning is pretty much the same, right? but it's, now it's just making us think. And this is a common theme in the Quran, a common methodology in the Quran, that Allah asks us questions to make us stop and think. Why would we actually obey such a person? This is what Allah is actually asking us to think about now. Why? That's the question being asked now. Why, if you have this temptation, this inclination towards obeying this person, why would you do so? Is it simply because he's got the status? Is it simply, simply because he's got, you know, power? Why is it that he has these qualities? Is it because he has got status and power? Is it because his love for this dunya has deceived him? Why is it that he is so readily uh, dismissing the Qur'an? So just blurting out the fact that his tales of the past. Why is it? Is it because he's got wealth and children? Is it again he's been deceived by these material effects away from what actually really matters? That's one recitation. Another recitation, in kana da mali mubaneen. Instead of an kana, simply because you're wife and sons, in kana da mali mubaneen. And in is a conditional statement now. Now it becomes a condition. Provided he has wife and sons. Provided he has wife and sons. Again, it's a similar sort of uh, reasoning process, right? Would you obey him on the condition that he has wife and sons? You're not going to obey a weak person. 
or a poor person. You're going to base someone who's, you know, not known, doesn't stand out in society. But you're more likely to, you know, you put a condition. I'm only going to base such a person because he has wealth and fund. You put that condition on, right? Um, is it that this condition that he will uh, uh, have these qualities because he, again, here again, this is, becomes very similar to previous meetings. It's because he has got wealth, on the condition he has got wealth and sons, he's had these qualities. On the condition that he has uh, wealth and sons, because of these qualities, so because of the fact he has wealth and sons, he has become like this as well. So the other two explanations also mean, uh, are, are, are become similar when it comes to the word in and an, in terms of the meaning. So even if it's conditional, the meaning becomes the same. Right. Am I making sense? I hope I'm making sense here. Right. So these are three uh, recitations. All three are from Revelation. And all three help us understand the meaning of this ayah. Uh, so this conditional thing in Kana, that you know, will you only follow him if he has got uh, children and sons, power and wealth, or if linked to the next ayah, such a person is more likely to be ungrateful and end up disbelieving and rejecting the Qur'an if he has wealth and children. Also linked to the previous verses, such a person is more likely to have these qualities if he has uh, these status and, 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 and wealth right, and power. What this additional layer of meaning here is telling us now is that not every single person who is wealthy and powerful has these qualities. You can be wealthy and powerful and still be righteous. Right? So by the, the third level, the third recitation is adding this extra layer of meaning that Allah is telling us that not every single person of wealth is evil. Not every single person of power is necessarily evil. Right? You can still have wealth and power and still be a good person. But it's more likely that you might get affected by this wealth and, and its status. And, and that state, wealth and status would actually distract you or, or divert you away from the path of Allah SWT. So, wealth and sons, they are a gift from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as such, they should be met with gratitude, with shukr. And the way you uh, meet these gifts from Allah is, uh, the way you show shukr in this area is increasing you in humility, increasing us in servitude to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. When we have these gifts, it's wealth and sons. But the people being spoken about in these verses, Allah is telling us the opposite of them. Allah is saying instead of them being grateful, they meet Allah's gifts with rejection and they meet Allah's gifts with arrogance. They're doing the opposite. And in this vein, Allah SWT says again, speaking about al walid ibn al-Mughira in Surah al-Mudathir, in a specific instance, but again the wording is general, so we take the meaning generally. But specifically, it's revealed with regards to Al Wali ibn al Mughiri, like these verses we're talking about today as well. Dharani wa man khalaqatu mahida. And leave me uh, to the one I created all by myself. Wa ja'altu lahu malam mamduda. And granted him abundant wealth and children. Uh, abundant wealth. Wa banina shuhuda. And children always by his side. Wa mahatu lahu tahdida. And I made life very, <coughs> very easy for him. ثُمَّ يَتْمَعُ azid. But then, despite all this, he wants more. He's hungry for more. He's greedy for more. كَلَّا إِنَّهُ كَانَ لِآيَاتِنَا عَنِيدًا Again, the same thing. What, what did this wealth and children lead up to? He has stubbornly rejected our revelations. He has stubbornly rejected our revelations. سَأُرْهِقُهُ سَعُودًا I will make his fate unbearable. إِنَّهُ فَكَّرَ وَقَدَّرَ He thought and he plotted. فَقُوتِلَ كَيْفَ قَدَّرَ May he be destroyed how he plotted. ثُمَّ قُوتِلَ كَيْفَ قَدَّرَ May again, again may he be destroyed for how he plotted. ثُمَّ نَظَرَ Then he looked. ثُمَّ عَبَسَ وَبَسَرَ And then he uh, frowned and he scowled. ثُمَّ أَدْبَرَ وَاسْتَقْبَرَ Then he turned around and became arrogant. فَقَالَ إِنْ هَذَا إِلَّا سِحْرٌ يُؤْثَرَ And he said, this is only magic. This is only magic. <coughs> this Quran is only magic. In Hada illa qawmul bashar. This is only the words of a man. 
This is only the words of a man. So Usli he suffered. And then Allah says, concluding, I will burn him in hell. I will burn him in hell. In these verses, Allah concludes by saying, Sa Usli he suffered, I will burn him in hell. In this surah we're discussing, Allah ends by saying, Sanasimuhu al khurtum We will brand him on a snap. We'll talk about this, the meaning of this in the next session, inshallah. So wealth and gift in and of themselves in Islam are not bad things. We regard them to be gifts from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And as I said, these gifts from Allah, they should lead us to being grateful to Allah, not to be ungrateful. These gifts from Allah should not lead us to being, becoming reliant on this world and greedy for this world. They should actually help us turn back to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala and uh, help us in our journey towards Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. <coughs> uh, so that is generally the meaning of this ayah. Points of benefit we derive from this verse. One of the points of benefit, in addition to what we discussed already, is that we learn from this ayah that wealth and prestige and power often, not always, but often corrupt a person. And as such, a Muslim who is wealthy, a Muslim who has status, a Muslim who has authority, needs to be cautious of this. We need to internalize this fact in ourselves and do not allow ourselves to be misled by the worldly status we might have. It's very, very dangerous. The dunya is a very dangerous thing. The world is a very dangerous thing. It's a very attractive, alluring thing. And it does its best to misguide us and divert us from Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. As I already mentioned, that wealth and sons are not intrinsically bad. It's not intrinsically a bad thing. They are good when they're put in their correct place. Al-malu wal babuna zinat al hayat al dunya. Wealth and children are the adornment of this worldly life. They're the beauty of this worldly life, for my sake. They're not evil, they're not bad, they're, they're a beautification. But they need to be put in their correct place, which is why Allah goes on to say, Wal baqiyatu salihat khayrun in the rabbika thwaba wa khayrun amala. But lasting good work, or good works that will eternally last. They are better in the sight of your Lord, in terms of reward, and they are better grounds for hope. Not your children, not your wealth. What's a better ground for reward and, and hope is the righteous deeds. Put wealth and children and property and everything, put that in its place. Don't let it di divert you from what about the other And also we learn from this ayah is that even though wealth and sons are intrinsically not bad, they are also not necessarily a proof of goodness. They are also not necessarily a proof that Allah uh, is uh, blessing you. It could be a punishment, it could be a test. They are not, they in themselves do not ensure success. Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala says, وَمَا أَمْوَالُكُمْ وَلَا أَوْلَادُكُمْ بِالَّتِي تُقَرِّبُكُمْ إِنْ دَنَا زُلْفَةً That your wealth and your children will not bring you nearer to us. Your wealth and your children will not bring you nearer to us. إِلَّا مَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ صَالِحَ فَأُولَئِكَ لَهُمْ جِزَاءُ الْدِعْفِ بِمَا عَمِلُ وَهُمْ فِي الْغُرَفَاتِ أَمِنُونَ But those who do good deeds will have multiple rewards for what they have done. And they will live safely in lofty dwellings of paradise. Allah says, يَوْمَ لَا يَنْفَعُ مَالٌ وَلَا بِنُونَ That last day is a day when wealth and children will not help you. Wealth and children will not help you. إِلَّا مَنْ أَتَى اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Except for one who comes to Allah with a sound heart. This is the only thing that helps in the last day. The sound heart. And the heart remains sound when it is detached from the dunya. We can help. There's nothing wrong in Islam, as I said. With, there's nothing wrong in Islam that with having, having wealth. We can earn money. We have a good standard of living. Yeah, you can have a good quality of life as well. That wealth is not a problem so long as it doesn't enter our hearts. The minute the wealth and the dunya enters the heart, that's when the heart loses its uh, soundness. That's when the heart loses its correctness. It starts becoming diseased. And no longer, إِلَّا مَنْ اللَّهَ بِقَلْبٍ سَلِيمٍ Our Messenger said, 
and it's a beautiful hadith. He said, Allah gives this world, this dunya, its wealth, its status, its honor, its prestige to those he loves and to those he does not love. But he only ever gives iman to those he loves. Allah gives this world to those he loves and to those he does not love, but he only ever gives iman to those he loves. In another narration of this hadith, he only ever gives religion, deen, to those he loves. Uh, this surah, we, uh, uh, towards the end of the surah, we talk about a topic called istidraj. It's uh, talking about how Allah, uh, step by step, as a punishment, leads a person to his destruction. Someone has decided, gone, decided an evil path, step by step Allah leads that person to destruction. And one of the roots that Allah uses is He blesses him with wealth. And He blesses him with children, gives him children, gives him wealth. But for that person, it's a punishment. Because it's <coughs> further sealing his fate. We're going to talk about this in detail inshallah, when we come towards the end of the surah. Another danger of wealth, which again led this person being talked about in these verses to have the quality he has, is that it leads man to think he's self-sufficient. It's all about me, the world revolves around me. Me, me, me. That indeed, man exceeds all bounds when he starts thinking himself as self-sufficient. He exceeds all bounds when he starts thinking himself as self-sufficient. Right. This person who's been given mal and bani, property and children, he starts thinking himself self-sufficient and then exceeds all bounds and he ends up having the qualities that Allah is listing in this surah. And a final point of benefit, sorry, not a final point, another point of benefit, we learn from this ayah, we need as Muslims, we need to start looking beyond the superficial and understand reality. We should not let the glamour and the wealth and the status fool us into thinking something that that person is something great. And that applies not just to individuals, it applies to communities and societies and nations. Don't let the, 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 the glamour and the wealth and the status of the West, for example, fool us into thinking they actually have something. They have some, some sort of morality that's worth actually following. The myth of morality has been unveiled when it comes to the West and Gaza, for example. Obviously, yes, it's clear, right? The myth of democracy, the myth of values, the myth of uh, the standard of law, the myth of justice, the myth of uh, having a moral code, all of that's been unveiled for these, you know, it's been highlighted and, and proven to be a complete and utter lie. Don't let their wealth and their status, and unfortunately so many Muslims in the world do this very thing when it comes to the West. These guys are powerful, these guys have got money, these guys have got, you know, they're running the world, therefore we should try to be like them. We need to look beyond the superficial. Right? Don't let the glamour and the wealth and the status of individuals and nations fool us. Piety does not, and strength and greatness does not lie in these things. Right. It lies in our relationship with Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. And this is why when Allah talks about Qarun and the great wealth that Qarun uh, had, and Allah talks about the two groups of people who, in response to Qarun's wealth, one group who couldn't see beyond the glamour, and one group who saw beyond the glamour. Right. He came out before his people in all his glamour. Those who desire the life of this world, they said, if only we could have something like what Qarun has been given. He is a truly a man of great fortune. The love of this world, and this is one of the diseases, one of the punishments, one of the effects of loving this dunya, is that it makes you very superficial. Right? It makes you very superficial. Their love of this world made them say, if only we could have something like he's got, what he has, if only we had it as well. He's, been, he's, a true, he's truly a man of great fortune. But then Allah says, وَقَالَ الَّذِينَ أُوتُوا الْعِلْمِ But the people of knowledge, those who could see beyond the superficial, who understood the reality, وَيْلَكُمْ ثَوَابُ اللَّهِ خَيْفٌ Woe to you, shame on you. Allah's reward is far greater. لِمَنْ آمَنَ وَعَمِلَ الصَّالِحًا For those who believe and do good. وَلَا يُلَقَّاهَا إِلَّا الصَّابِرُونَ And none will attain this reward. And none will attain the ability to do the righteous deeds except for those who have suffered, except for those who are steadfast.
Ibn Jawzi rahmatullahi says, and this is where we conclude. He said, do not be deceived by a person's eloquence. Do not be fooled by his prayer, his fasting, his charity, his seclusion. The real man, the real servant of Allah, is someone who sets store by two things. Protecting the limits set by Allah and sincerity in action. He preserves Allah's hudud. He sets a, he, the, the boundaries Allah has set, he doesn't overstep them. He doesn't go beyond them. He doesn't transgress and encroach onto the haram. And sincerity is always sincere to not to people. He's not doing things for the sake of people. He's sincere to Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala. He said, how many worshippers, how many people who pray and give zakat, how many have we, have we seen who violate the limits set by Allah subhanahu wa ta'ala? They backbite, they do the haram, they surrender to their lust and desires. How many lessons have we learned? How many people have we seen from people who are outwardly seen religious? But what they're doing is for the sake of this world. The sincerity is not there. This may, in this disease, he says, you'll find it in different limits, different, in different levels amongst mankind. But the man, the real man, is the one who takes into account the limits of Allah and what has been obligated upon him and then commits to it. This is a reality. And inshallah we'll stop there for today. Subhanakum wa hamdikushu la ilahi wa anta astaghfirullah wa tawbi ilayk.